We're going to prove this result within number theory that uh, looks very, very simple. And in fact, the proof itself is very few lines. It's not going to look like it's a lot of work. However, there are some really important concepts underneath how we prove this, which uh, are probably what you might struggle with when you're trying to think of a way to actually make a path through this question. So let's read the question uh, and then we're going to have a go at number one, laying some helpful foundations, um, trying to really deeply understand some things, some ideas you've been doing for a long time, but in the language of the nature of proof and then we'll, we'll do the proof itself. Prove that an integer is the sum of seven consecutive integers if and only if it is divisible by seven. Now uh, if you have a look at this uh, clearly there are some important pieces that are worth noting. Uh, we're going to have to work with the sum of seven consecutive integers and we can phrase that in algebraic terms. Um, we have a divisibility issue here right so um, divisible by seven we also know how to explain that uh, or articulate that and express that in algebraic terms it's just a multiple of seven so seven times some integer. But I actually think the weirdest and trickiest part of this um, is kind of hiding in plain sight. It's this part here if and only if. You might recall this as the language that we use when two statements are equivalent, um, which is to say um, one statement implies uh, the, the sort of antecedent clause, implies the consequent clause, and also the same is true in reverse. Uh, the converse is also true, that the if you know the uh, consequent clause, that also implies the antecedent clause. So uh, I guess we would say that we could use this uh, you know, double-sided arrow here, right? That the, the implication is true and its converse is true. So not only is the sum of seven consecutive integers going to be divisible by seven, but you can also say any number divisible by seven can be written as the sum of seven consecutive integers, which is much less obvious. Now, in order to get at this, what I want you to recall is that actually you've been dealing with equivalent statements, um, if and only if, implication and converse are also true. You've been dealing with them for years and years, we've just never clothed them in this formal language of proof. Let me give you an example to try and convince you of this. If I gave you, let's just go with green because that's what we're trying to consider here. If I gave you some random algebraic statement like m plus 1 on 3 equals 4. Uh, instinctively you're probably looking at this and thinking, well this is not a hard thing to solve. I'm just going to try and make n the subject. So the most obvious first thing to do is multiply by 3. So if you did that, you would write this. Now here's what I want to get across to you, right? These are two different statements n plus 1 on 3 equals 4. It's a conditional statement. By the way, it isn't true for all values of n. It's only true for a certain value of n, namely 11. But what you then write underneath this is its own statement, which is related to the previous one, not just by arith arithmetic. It's also related by logic. Can you see that these two statements here are actually what we now call equivalent statements? If this is true, if this is true that n plus 1 on 3 equals 4, it necessarily follows that n plus 1 equals 12. But the converse is also true. There's no reason why you can't go in reverse. n plus 1 equals 12 also implies that n plus 1 on 3 equals 4. I just have to divide both sides by 3. What I guess I'm trying to say here is that, I don't know, in 99.99999% of all of the working in mathematical problems you've been doing, whenever you've written an equation and then written the next thing by doing some kind of operation to both sides, you've almost always been writing an if and only if statement. You've just never articulated it. Now, in a small number of cases, this isn't always true. Um, and now we have the language to explain what's going on. For example, if I said to you, and just stay with me even though this is like mind-numbingly simple, just for the sake of illustration. Suppose I said to you that x equals 5, right? Does this imply, can I say that this statement will mean that x squared equals 25? Just think about it for a minute. And the answer is yes. Of course it must. If x equals 5, when you square it, there's nothing else you can possibly get. It has to be 25. But this is not an if and only if statement. This is why we draw attention to it when we're first dealing with quadratic equations, that kind of thing. Um, if I gave you instead, and this is a, I'm going to treat this as a separate example, x squared equals 25, does that imply that x equals 5? Is the converse of example 2 
True, and the answer is no, it is not true because x squared equals 25 implies there's another possibility. x can of course also equal negative five. There's the negative case here, right? So I guess what I'm trying to say here is, um, I'm trying to highlight that for some operations, like say squaring and canceling as well is, is in a similar boat, right? you have to be very careful with the direction of your implication. And this is something that students famously get confused by when we're thinking about square roots. Why do we only take the positive value and not take both? And it has to do with the, the asymmetry of this, um, of this logical statement, okay? This is one of those very few examples where one equation is not true if and only if it's related, you know, sort of, I, I felt like I did the same thing to both sides, I just squared it, right? Um, this is one of the unusual cases. Under most circumstances, you know, a lot of the work that we've been doing uh, will fall under this case, an if and only if. So what this means is, how do I prove an if and only if statement? If I can do it through a series of fairly straightforward, if this is true algebraically, this equals this, then applying an operation to both sides, you know, preserves that, that truth statement, then I've arrived at my if and only if. So now I've laid a foundation that basically writing equations that flow on one necessarily from the other is equivalent logically to saying a string of if and only if statements. Now I'm ready to actually prove this question. Here's how I'm going to go about it. Proof. Um, let the uh, smallest of the seven integers, let the smallest integer equal n minus three, where, because I'm in integer land, I need to specify that n is an integer to make n minus three an integer. Now this might seem very random, but it's not going to be in about 60 seconds. If the smallest integer is n minus three, then it is not difficult to write the sum of the seven consecutive integers that start with n minus three. I can say, therefore, the sum of seven consecutive integers will equal what? And the answer is equals, I start with n minus three, let me put a bracket, set of brackets around it to make it clear that that's one number. And then the next one along will be n minus two. I'm just incrementing by one. And then n minus one, and then even, n, there's my uh, fourth number. Then I keep going in my adding one pattern. There's my uh, fifth number, here comes the sixth one, and then here comes the seventh one. All right, so now you can see why I hope I started with n minus three, because I wanna get some canceling happening, right? This minus three is gonna cancel with this plus three. This minus two is gonna cancel with this plus two. You get the idea. So what am I getting? It's just gonna be n plus n plus n. I've got seven of these things because there's seven consecutive integers. So that's clearly equal to seven n. But I said n is an integer. So therefore seven n must be uh, seven times an integer, that's a multiple of seven, i.e. a multiple of seven. Therefore, the sum of seven consecutive integers must be divisible by seven because all multiples of seven by definition are. And because what I've done is I've gone through uh, these uh, equations, not doing anything dramatic, not doing any like squaring or taking square roots that would muck with the direction of my um, implication. Every line here is an if and only if statement. So the sum of seven consecutive integers equals this, if and only if it's equal to this, which it is if and only if it's equal to this. And so if it's a multiple of seven, um, then the implication also runs in the reverse direction. I can just climb back up um, my ladder and I've, I've proven that if it's divisible by seven, it's also for the sum of seven consecutive integers. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I know it might be a bit obtuse to think about such a simple proof and to think about it in this deep way, um, but that's kind of why we're, we're doing this topic, the nature of proof. We're really trying to dig deep down into the foundations of why the things that we say are true actually are reliable.